Mark Sullivan was a man caught between two worlds, one of past traumas he couldn't forget and the other of a mundane existence he wished to escape. Nestled in the embrace of his dimly lit office in Rogers, Arkansas, he gazed down at the solitary photograph before him, a junkyard replete with decomposing vehicles and rusting scraps lay still under the leaden Arkansas sky. The phone on his desk trilled, shaking him from his contemplation. Sullivan, he rasped, his voice as rough as the five o'clock shadow dusting his jawline. Mr. Sullivan, this is Marlene. Got a new case for you, the voice on the other end announced. Arsenal trafficking, she continued. Local junkyard. Rogers PD swamped with other cases. Her voice was imbued with a rush of urgency. Mark let out a sigh, rubbing the creases between his brows, a trademark of years spent deciphering secrets. The silence lingered, and he could almost hear Marlene's eyebrows rising over the line. Sure, Marlene, I'll handle it, he replied. Just as he replaced the receiver, he noticed the photograph again. The image, a crude mesh of metal and dust, seemed to mock his existence, a chaotic representation of his own life. His gaze softened and he allowed the memories to wash over him. He was a man of kindness, of selflessness, a trait that often seemed a contradiction to his profession. He remembered the victims he'd fought for, the innocence he'd saved, the smiles that momentarily healed his wounded heart. Yet the specter of loss was never far. He would close his eyes and there she was, Emily, his dear wife, as alive as the memory of her death. His hands clenched around the photograph as he wrestled with the pain, the guilt. He had been a bystander, a spectator in the cruel drama of life and death. It wasn't a memory, but a haunting, relentless ghost. It was this guilt that propelled him toward redemption. This desire had taken form in mending the frayed threads, binding him to his estranged daughter, Maya. A relationship left to the elements of time and distance, much like the rusted relics populating the junkyard in the photograph. Shaking his head free from the cobwebs of the past, he refocused his gaze on the photograph. He had a case to solve, a purpose to serve. All right, Mark, time to dive into another mess, he murmured to himself, a determined glint sparking in his eyes. He tucked the photograph into his jacket, the fabric mimicking his heartbeats, erratic yet alive. It was a bone-chilling morning in Rogers. Mark found himself in the heart of the junkyard that felt like a mosaic of discarded memories and rusted dreams. He navigated through the maze of scrapped vehicles, old refrigerators, and mangled bicycles, each narrating their own tale of neglect. In the heart of this man-made wilderness, he began his investigation. From clandestine meetings with whistleblowers to painstakingly collecting evidence, each day brought him closer to the truth. Yet, with every passing day, a sense of disquiet started to pervade his thoughts. A hint of a hushed symphony that grew louder with each sunset. A veteran of reading between the lines of reality, he felt his understanding of the world around him start to wobble. Night after night, he found himself imprisoned within peculiar dreams. Dreams where cosmic entities with incomprehensible geometries danced and the stars whispered cryptic lullabies. He woke up drenched in cold sweat, his breath hitching, his mind rebelling against the strangeness. They're just dreams, side effects of overworking. That's all, he muttered to his reflection, brushing off the fear niggling at the back of his mind. But even as he did, he found himself tracing the outline of a monstrous entity from his dreams on the steamy bathroom mirror, its form as elusive as a half-remembered melody. In stark contrast to these new eerie experiences, his efforts to mend his relationship with Maya bore fruit. Through phone calls that lasted hours and weekend visits to her college, he found himself slowly bridging the chasm of estrangement. One such visit found him sitting across Maya in a quaint cafe, his fingers absent-mindedly rotating the coffee mug. Maya, a young woman with her mother's eyes, was saying something about her course, but the words barely registered. His mind was still ensnared in the echo of his morning dream, a silhouette of an otherworldly creature superimposed on his daughter's animated face. He blinked hard, forcing the image away. I'm listening, sweetheart, 
he reassured her, a lopsided smile tracing his lips. Maya tilted her head, becoming a mirror image of her mother's quizzical gaze. You okay, Dad? You look distant. Mark nodded, offering a muted laugh. Just work stuff. She studied him for a moment, then nodded, diving back into her narrative. He listened, the echo of his daughter's laughter, a soothing balm for the strange dreams threatening to unbalance his life. The days turned into a blur of strange visions and mundane realities. A persistent question began to surface in his weary mind. Could there be a hidden connection between the cosmic horrors he dreamt of and the weapon dealings he was investigating? The threads of reality seemed to intertwine with the spectral strands of his nightmares, crafting a tapestry he couldn't decipher yet. As he wrapped up another late-night inspection of the junkyard, he found himself standing before a massive pile of metal scrap. The moon's glow gave it an otherworldly appearance, reminiscent of the cosmic entities from his dreams. He shivered, a sense of dread creeping under his skin. Maybe, just maybe, this isn't as mundane as I thought, he whispered into the void, unaware of how prophetic his words were. Unseen, the moon hid behind a cloud, casting the junkyard into an uncanny darkness, an eerie prelude to the heart of the looming chaos. As the relentless clockwork of days and nights unfurled, Mark's journey continued, his feet stepping deeper into the underbelly of a reality uncharted. Clues unfolded from the seemingly ordinary junkyard. A hidden compartment filled with illegal armaments here, an arcane symbol etched into the dirt there. Each revelation spun an intricate web, shadowy tendrils linking the mundane to the extraordinary. One evening, as twilight weaved its gray tapestry over the junkyard, he stumbled upon a chilling discovery. Hidden amidst the heaps of refuse was a shrine-like alcove, housing a peculiar artifact, a twisted piece of metal resembling the monstrous entities that haunted his dreams. His heart hammered against his chest, the coldness of fear turning his blood to ice. His dreams weren't mere figments of an overworked mind. They were premonitions, visions bridging the chasm between his world and something infinitely more complex, infinitely more terrifying. His initial fear gave way to a strange determination. If the nightmares were a key to unraveling this mystery, he would use them. For the sake of his town, for the sake of his daughter, he would brave the tempest of cosmic horrors. As he wrestled with this new revelation, another unexpected transformation took root. The strained relationship with Maya was beginning to heal. She became an anchor in his tumultuous reality, a lighthouse piercing through the tempest. Their conversations were no longer mere exchanges. They became lifelines, sustaining him amidst the escalating chaos. During a weekend visit, they found themselves at the edge of Beaver Lake, their silence echoing in the serene landscape. Maya, her eyes reflecting the calming blues of the water, broke the silence. You've changed, Dad. You're more here, not as lost in your thoughts. Mark smiled, gazing at the tranquil lake. I am trying, Maya, trying to fix the mistakes I've made. With you, with, with Emily. His voice faltered, the wound still fresh. Maya rested her head on his shoulder as a silent acknowledgement, a silent acceptance of his remorse and his effort to mend the broken ties. Meanwhile, the cosmic horrors weren't content being mere specters in his dreams. They began to bleed into his waking hours. Shadows seemed to twist into unspeakable shapes. Whispers echoed when no one was around, and a constant feeling of being watched pervaded his senses. The nightmares and the real world intertwined, creating a surreal landscape that only he could perceive. Undeterred, he continued his investigation. Armed with his newfound understanding of the cosmic horrors and his unwavering resolve, he confronted the nefarious network operating under the guise of a junkyard. A deadly cat and mouse game ensued, every encounter pushing him closer to the heart of darkness. Mark found himself standing at the threshold of the junkyard, the once benign wasteland, now a menacing labyrinth, a portal into the realms of cosmic horror. Yet behind the seemingly insurmountable challenge, there lay an odd sense of exhilaration, a thrill that sent an electric pulse through his veins. 
He knew he had become an unlikely hero in an even more unlikely tale. His fate entwined with that of an entity from the depths of the cosmos. His investigation, fueled by courage and an uncanny understanding of his visions, gradually unveiled the shadowy cabal operating behind the junkyard's rusty facade. Leveraging his dreams, he managed to anticipate their sinister operations, intervening at critical junctures, disrupting their nefarious plans. Each confrontation, each unexpected triumph, left them baffled, their frustration palpable in the cool Arkansas air. One afternoon, over a hurried lunch at a bustling diner, he found himself wrestling with an intense vision. The cosmic horrors infiltrated his reality, a spectral ballet unfolding right there between the clinking cutlery and murmuring patrons. He clenched his fists, trying to anchor himself to the mundane, but the visions were overwhelmingly vivid. He could almost touch the shape-shifting entity, its form a cruel mockery of Euclidean geometry, its gaze a swirling vortex threatening to swallow him. Maya, observant as ever, held his hand. Dad, you're far away again, she said, her voice threaded with concern. Mark blinked, the vision receding, leaving him back in the clamor of the diner. Just a headache, he replied, offering her a weak smile. He couldn't tell her the truth, couldn't let her take part in his nightmarish reality. As days dissolved into nights and the dreams grew more potent, he realized a harrowing truth. The Cabal was not merely dealing in weapons, they were acolytes of the cosmic entity. They believed the beast they worshipped would grant them unimaginable power. He shivered at the thought. This wasn't just a game of cat and mouse anymore. It was a race against time to prevent the waking of an ancient horror. Night descended on Rogers, cloaking the world in an inscrutable shroud. The junkyard lay under the gaze of an unfathomable cosmos, its tranquility a facade for the tempest about to unfold. Mark, standing at the heart of the storm, felt an unprecedented calm. His dreams had prepared him for this moment, his path converging with an ancient entity from the stars. The air was thick with anticipation, a silent lull before the world tipped over into the abyss of chaos. Just as midnight struck, the Cabal emerged, their robes dancing in the wind, their chants slicing through the silence. Hidden in the shadows, he observed as they circled the twisted artifact, their words a grotesque symphony summoning the unseen menace. His heart hammered in his chest, not from fear, but determination. He stepped forward, his voice booming through the junkyard. Stop! This ends tonight! Surprised faces turned towards him, their chants faltering. He stood firm, his eyes locked onto theirs. This was his stand, his final confrontation. Even as he defied the Cabal, his mind teetered on the edge of reality and dreams, his senses heightened, his understanding of the cosmic horror his only weapon. A struggle ensued, but he was relentless. He battled with every ounce of his will, the strength of his resolve channeled into each parry and attack. At the same time, he wrestled with his dreams, the monstrous entity's whispers growing louder in his mind, the vision of the Cabal's twisted artifact echoing ominously. Yet amidst the chaos, a sliver of sanity held him grounded. Maya's laughter, Emily's loving memory, the fear of losing his beloved town to these cosmic horrors. He fought not as a lone investigator, but as a father, a protector, a savior. As the physical confrontation raged on, a separate battle unfolded within his psyche. The cosmic entity beckoned, its formless whispers an inviting abyss. He resisted, his dreams intertwining with his present, forming a labyrinth that he navigated with an unyielding resolve. He was not merely an observer of these horrors now. He was a participant. The climax arrived as suddenly as a thunderclap. As the last of the cabal fell, Mark stood before the artifact. He felt its otherworldly pull, the whispers of oblivion growing louder. With a final surge of determination, he grabbed the artifact, the touch searing his flesh. Yet he held on, his defiance resonating against the cosmic horror. The world held its breath. A cosmic scream echoed through the night, the entity recoiling from his unyielding resistance. A pulse of energy radiated from the artifact, and then there was silence. 
The artifact crumbled to dust. The cosmic entity retreated, its menacing whispers silenced. He collapsed, exhaustion overtaking him, yet a triumphant smile curved his lips. He had prevailed and had prevented the waking of an ancient horror. As the sun rose over Rogers, a new day dawned, a day untouched by the cosmic horror. The world was as mundane as it had been, and Mark Sullivan was just an investigator, a father, a man who had braved what was unfathomable. He visited Maya later that day, his battle scars a testament to his unspoken adventure. As he hugged her, he knew he had more than just confronted cosmic horrors. He had mended a relationship and had reconnected with his own humanity. The world moved on, unaware of the bullet they had dodged. The story of a kind, selfless man forever intertwined with the cosmic tapestry. Becoming a guardian of reality, he retreated into his ordinary life, carrying within him the extraordinary tale of his defiance against the whispers of oblivion. In Conway, Arkansas, the fading sunset cast long, lazy shadows, swallowing the streets in an ominous gloom. Detective James Adler sat in his weather-beaten car parked across from the Stygian Sapphire, a pulsating nightclub at the heart of town. His rugged face was a patchwork of lines and contours, a testament to a life steeped in relentless pursuits and profound losses. He absent-mindedly traced the edges of an old photo of three children, two of which were frozen in youthful gaiety, their smiles bright and uncomplicated. The third child, he noticed, had a somber cast to his young face, a premature weight of seriousness that sat uncomfortably on his childish features. This third child was Adler himself, the other two ghosts of a past marred by tragedy. The radio murmured in the background, a low monotonous drone of Conway's minutia. His heavy-lidded eyes remained fixed on the club, its neon blue signs splintering the darkness attracting all kinds of souls like moss to a flame. Inside those walls lay a shadowy underbelly that was whispering for his attention, a world he intended to unmask. Shutting off the car engine, he crossed the street and stepped into the Stygian Sapphire, surrendering to the heady cocktail of sweat, alcohol, and raucous laughter. The club was alive with a reckless vitality that washed across his senses. Yet beneath the veneer of revelry, he discerned an underlying layer of unease. The eyes that met his were cautious, their smiles a beat too slow. Approaching the bar, he struck up a conversation with the grizzled bartender. You see many new faces in here, Hank, he asked, his gaze scanning the crowd. The bartender gave him a long, measured look before responding. Detective, in this place, it's not the new faces you need to worry about. It's the old ones. As he pondered the cryptic reply, a figure detached itself from the shadows, sliding onto the barstool next to him. A woman, her face an inscrutable mask, her eyes holding the ancient knowledge of the stars themselves. The moon is weeping tonight, detective, she whispered, her voice a melody of dread and warning. He raised a questioning eyebrow. What do you mean? Sometimes, she began, her voice low, it weeps for the children of Conway, with that, she left him with his thoughts swirling in the din of the nightclub. Outside, the world was shrouded in a nocturnal silence, and somewhere in the distance, a hound howled, a mournful lament that echoed the detective's brewing apprehension. Unseen by any eye, a sinister shadow twisted and convulsed, mirroring the slow churn of terror that was beginning to take root in the heart of Conway. The thick dawn mist swallowed the streets, a spectral veil that bore the silent promise of untold secrets. Adler awoke in his modest lodgings, the taste of the previous night's peculiar encounter still lingering, the cryptic warning of the woman echoing in his ears. A shadow had been cast, painting his world in hues of dread and suspicion. Pulling on a worn jacket, he found himself drawn to the Stygian Sapphire, a beacon amid the fog-drenched streets. He was greeted by a different beast in the harsh light of day, Devoid of the nightly revelers, it was silent, save for the discordant hum of the cleaning crew, their faces mirroring the dull hue of the morning. A conversation with Hank, the bartender, unearthed some disturbing threads. Some folks around here, he began running a rag over the polished counter, they've got tastes. Tastes? Adler queried, 
his eyes narrowing. Old traditions, Hank responded, his voice barely a whisper. Things that ain't meant for city folk. His suspicions aroused, he began to dissect the underbelly of the town. The investigation was punctuated by tense, whispered conversations, guarded exchanges in dim-lit corners, and anxious glances shot his way. Each interaction added another piece to a puzzle that grew darker with each revelation. One evening, he found himself at the town library, the ancient tomes whispering their lore. An eccentric librarian guided him through the annals of Conway's history, through stories of a clandestine cult whose practices were rooted in antiquity. The word sanguine appeared time and again, associated with rituals and rites. The week drew to a close with an unsettling discovery. In the early hours of a windswept morning, he chanced upon a chilling scene at the outskirts of the town, a field littered with animal bones, each meticulously stripped of flesh, their marrow hollowed out with a chilling precision that defied any natural predator. A nauseating realization settled in his heart, linking the pieces together in a horrifying image. As he stood among the field of bones, the wind carrying away his whispered curses, the horror of his findings started to dawn upon him. The chilling whisperings of sanguine rites, the enigmatic warnings of the nightclub patron, the grotesque field of stripped bones, they painted a terrifying tableau of the darkness that clung to Conway. As the first streaks of dawn painted the sky, he knew that the next chapter of his investigation would lead him deeper into the abyss of Conway's horrifying secret. In the haunting embrace of twilight, the small town of Conway sank beneath a cloak of uneasy anticipation. A primal sense of fear began to manifest itself, gnawing at the edges of Adler's consciousness. He felt the invisible tendrils of the town's secret creeping into his psyche, wrapping him tighter with each horrifying revelation. One night, he found himself drawn again to the Stygian Sapphire. The pulse of music was oddly subdued, the patrons' laughter hushed. He felt their eyes on him, the weight of their shared secret forming a tangible barrier between them and him. Beneath the throb of music, he caught a haunting melody, an undercurrent of an ancient, forgotten language that clawed at his mind. It was a hymn, a litany echoing through the annals of time, reverberating through the club like the steady heartbeat of some colossal slumbering beast. The patron's eyes glazed over, entranced, their bodies swaying in unison with the eldritch rhythm. And then, amidst the euphoria, the club's doors swung open. A procession of hooded figures entered, cradling a grotesque bounty in their arms. His heart pounded in his chest as the horrifying truth unfolded before his eyes, a feast of raw, bloody flesh. His mind spun with a terrifying realization. The bone field, the sanguine rites, the unspoken warnings, the haunting him, they all pointed to a single horrifying truth. A cult of cannibals lurked in the heart of Conway. The chilling spectacle sent a shiver crawling down his spine, the horror of a tangible entity constricting his breath. He forced himself to stay, to watch, to commit every detail to memory. The patrons partook in the feast, their ecstasy mirrored in their grotesque revelry. He swallowed the bile rising in his throat, his heart hammering against his ribcage. Emerging into the cold dawn, the taste of terror still fresh on his tongue, he knew the depth of the abyss he was poised to plunge into. His path was now clear. He had to confront the cult and face their macabre rituals. Darkness blanketed the town of Conway, an oppressive weight that bore down on Adler with a relentless intensity. Each shadowed alley, every quiet corner, seemed to echo with an insidious whisper, inviting him further into its twisted depths. His dreams became plagued with cryptic visions, haunting specters of cannibalistic feasts and dancing shadows. The star-studded sky morphed into a sea of hungry eyes, their gaze piercing through the veil of his sanity. These were no mere nightmares. He recognized them for what they were, the nascent tendrils of cosmic horror beginning to infiltrate his psyche. One evening, while navigating the labyrinthine streets of Conway, he felt an uncanny sense of being followed. A chill crept up his spine as he caught sight of a figure lurking in the periphery, a silhouette that seemed to flicker in and out of existence. 
The figure bore an uncanny resemblance to the mysterious woman from the nightclub, her cryptic words now ringing with a more ominous undertone. His days were filled with tense confrontations and veiled threats. The townsfolk, once merely wary, now stared at him with open hostility. He was a foreign element, a disruptor in their deeply entrenched, horrifying traditions. One night, he received an invitation, a delicately crafted note bearing no name, only an address in a time. It was an invitation to a place at the heart of Conway's secret, a location thought to be the cult's sacred ground. He understood the risks, but he also knew it was his only chance to expose the monstrous reality lurking beneath the facade of this quaint town. He arrived at the specified location at the stroke of midnight, the eerie stillness sending shivers down his spine. He felt a grim resolution settle over him as he ventured into the abandoned structure, the building echoing with the ghost of ancient rites and forgotten horrors. Adler knew he was stepping into the jaws of madness, walking into a trap meticulously laid out by the cult. But he also recognized the necessity of his sacrifice. As the door closed behind him, sealing his fate, he felt a semblance of peace. The midnight hour fell over Conway, its silence a haunting requiem for the night's eerie solemnity. Adler stood within the heart of the cult sanctuary, the marrow-chilling cold seeping into his very bones. He felt the shroud of an inescapable dread descend upon him, the specter of the endless night wrapping its cold embrace around his heart. The chamber was bathed in a ghostly pallor, flickering shadows dancing across the time-worn stone. He could discern traces of the archaic rites, symbols etched into the stone floor, the heavy scent of dried blood hanging in the air, the lingering echo of ancient chants that seemed to seep from the very walls. A procession emerged from the depths of the sanctuary, their hooded figures a nightmarish tableau under the dim light. The woman from the nightclub led them, her eyes reflecting the abyssal darkness that shrouded the cult. Her lips parted, and from them flowed the eldritch hymn he had heard at the Stygian Sapphire. The haunting melody filled the room, the ancient language curling around his mind, tightening its grip on his sanity. Welcome, detective, her voice rang out, the sound reverberating against the stone. You sought the truth, now behold. An offering was brought forth, a human form, trussed and hooded. His blood ran cold as the hood was removed to reveal a face twisted in fear. It was Hank, the bartender, his eyes pleading for a salvation he knew would not come. The ritual commenced, a horrifying spectacle that gripped his soul with an iron fist. The air filled with the scent of blood and terror, the echoes of Hank's screams bouncing off the stone walls. Despite his horror, he found himself unable to look away, entranced by the macabre dance unfolding before him. He felt his sanity teetering on the edge of an abyss, the horrifying reality of Conway threatening to shatter his mind. The shadows grew longer, the night endless, and he realized he was no longer an outsider to this horror. He was now a part of it, swallowed completely by madness. His death did not come as a surprise. As the cultists turned towards him, their bloody hands reaching out, he felt no fear. He was an offering to the cosmic horrors, a willing sacrifice to expose the hidden terror of Conway. As the cold steel cut through his flesh, his last thoughts were not of fear, but of an eerie peace. The sun sat low over Bentonville, casting elongated silhouettes of the town's red brick facades. A meek surrender to the encroaching twilight, the sun's feeble rays lost their battle against the sprawling darkness. Nestled amidst the suburban tableau, an old building, weathered by time, stood resilient, the local homeless shelter. A nondescript figure, shoulders stooped with the weight of age and wisdom, approached the shelter. It was Edwin Goodwin, a familiar face around Bentonville, more so to its forgotten denizens. A local journalist, he bore the kind of countenance that held stories as deeply etched as the lines on his face. His conversation with Mrs. Doris, the aging director of the shelter, was laden with the comfort of old friendship. Still fighting the good fight, I see, he noted, a soft smile curving his lips, eyes twinkling with admiration. Doris shrugged, her smile a brittle testament 
to her enduring spirit. Someone's got to, Ed. These folks don't have much else. He looked over the room, landing on the inhabitants of the shelter. His gaze was kind, yet underneath the kindness lay a hint of sorrow. There was an unsaid familiarity to this kind of poverty, a shadow from his own past. He'd spent his childhood not too dissimilarly, an existence that hardened his spirit yet kept his heart tender. He saw a mirror of his former self in these souls, forgotten by the world, yet resilient in their existence. His conversation with one of the homeless, a man named Joe, was filled with a shared understanding. The words they exchanged were as much about the hard realities of life as they were about the town's rumors of smugglers and strange happenings. Edwin's keen journalistic instinct tingled at the hint of an untold story. Under the guise of the usual, there was an undercurrent of something unsaid, something unseen. Whispers among the homeless, Tensions uncharacteristic of the close-knit community. Things that didn't add up. The familiar rustling of Bentonville was becoming a haunting lullaby of secrets and intrigue. Walking back to his small, cluttered office later that night, his mind was a whirl of thoughts. He knew he owed a debt to Doris and the shelter for the kindness they had shown him in his time of need. The tendrils of gratitude reaching across the years spurred him on, a slow-burning flame of determination ignited in his heart. It wasn't just another story to him. It was a chance to return the favor. The town of Bentonville awakened to a dawn as silent as the whispers Edwin sought to decode. With the morning's first light, he was once again at the shelter, his senses alert, eyes probing, ready to unravel the enigma of the unsettling tales he had begun to hear. He settled into a routine of spending his days among the shelter's inhabitants, trying to unearth the truth behind the strange occurrences. His persistence became a gentle hum in the rhythm of the shelter. His compassionate queries a melody in the cacophony of whispers. Joe, once a reticent conversationalist, began to open up, the lines of his hardened visage softening as trust was gradually forged. Beneath the veneer of their mundane conversations about the weather, the conditions at the shelter, the latest football scores, a chilling narrative began to emerge. Tales of figures that moved like shadows, of voices that seemed to echo from a bottomless abyss, of people who were there one day and inexplicably gone the next. He found himself conversing more with Doris. The quiet fortitude in her eyes was beginning to give way to an undercurrent of fear. She spoke hesitantly about the men who came under the shroud of darkness. Men who wore the skin of charity, yet their eyes reflected a deeper, darker purpose. I think they're smugglers, Ed, Doris whispered one evening, her voice trembling like a leaf in the wind. I, I can't prove it, but I've seen things. The way they look at our people, it's like they're appraising cattle, not helping humans. The more he delved into the mystery, the more alien it felt. A spectral dread was descending on the shelter, a presence that was not of this world. He felt it, a chill creeping into his very marrow, a pervasive silence that echoed with otherworldly whispers. His journalistic instinct and his desire to protect the inhabitants of the shelter were like twin flames, pushing him deeper into the labyrinth of uncertainty. His brave pursuit of truth was tested by the emergence of fear, a fear that gnawed at the edges of his sanity, yet he persisted. A clandestine shroud enveloped Bentonville as Edwin delved deeper into the mystery. The uncanny whispers that he'd heard took form in the chilling discovery he made. Alien parasites were controlling people within the shelter. This was no common smuggling operation. It was a reality-bending, nightmarish infiltration that transcended the realm of the ordinary. His first encounter with these parasitic creatures was in the quietude of a Bentonville night. He had tracked one of the suspicious men to a secluded area on the outskirts of town. Concealed within the embrace of darkness, he watched as the man performed a grotesque transformation. The man's form wavered, a shadow within shadows and then contorted unnaturally, revealing the alien entity that was hiding beneath the skin of a human. A surge of terror and disbelief washed over him as he bore witness to the otherworldly spectacle. Yet his seasoned resolve did not falter. The brave heart that had weathered poverty and hardship was not easily deterred. As the monstrous reality unfolded before him, 
his journalistic instinct transformed into a fervor to protect his community. In the following days, his conversations with Doris and Joe took on a grimmer note. The words exchanged were no longer whispers. They were pleas for understanding, for belief in the unbelievable. His voice carried the weight of his chilling discovery, painting a picture of the lurking shadows that threatened to consume their peaceful existence. Joe, a man weathered by hardships, bore the news with a stoic calmness. Always knew there was something off about those folks, he muttered, his gaze distant. Doris, however, struggled with the revelation. The sanctuary she had worked so hard to maintain was invaded by unimaginable horrors. Yet her spirit remained unbroken, the fire in her eyes a testament to her enduring resolve. His days were now filled with cautious observations, cryptic dialogues, and surreptitious investigations. Every conversation, every interaction became a potential clue. He kept his knowledge hidden, navigating the thin line between revealing the terrifying truth and inciting panic. Each step he took was a dance with danger, his every action fraught with the possibility of alerting the alien entities of his knowledge. The slow burn of horror mixed with the adrenal rush of his perilous endeavor. And amidst this daunting reality, he stood steadfast, fueled by his unwavering bravery and the unspoken promise he had made to Doris and to himself. As he found himself pulled further into the creeping abyss, the small town of Bentonville transformed before his eyes. Once a beacon of tranquility, it now harbored a cosmic horror within its unsuspecting boundaries. The lurking shadows of the alien parasites were now an integral part of his world, a silent invasion that threatened to engulf his beloved community. The unveiling of the cosmic terror had birthed a ticking clock within the heart of Bentonville. With each passing day, Edwin felt the dread-laden seconds fall away, a sand glass of inevitability emptying as the hour of reckoning neared. As he tried to strategize, the alien parasite's pervasive reach gnawed at the edges of his mind. He walked through the town, his every step echoing the surreality of the situation. The familiar sights, the park where children played, the local grocery store, the church's silent steeple, were all touched by the insidious spread of the alien parasites. He continued his discussions with Doris and Joe, each dialogue now carrying the urgency of a time bomb. They spoke in hushed voices, their words wreathed in the mingling fear and resolve. They were no longer just sharing information, but were waging a silent war, an act of defiance against the imminent doom. Dorse's office had become a refuge, a hub for their secret meetings. It was within these confinements that he shared his plans, his ideas on how to fight back. We have to find their weakness. There must be something we can do to stop them, he would assert his eyes gleaming with determination. And yet his brave endeavor felt like an ant staring down a tidal wave. His resilience was met with the stark realization of his own insignificance in the grand cosmic scheme. He was a single man against an entity that was not just of another world, but of another realm of existence. The once comforting familiarity of his town now echoed with eerie strangeness. Every smile of his neighbors, every polite nod was now laced with uncertainty. Who was under the control of the alien parasite, and who was still clinging on to their fading human will? As the days trickled into weeks, he found himself descending further into this foreboding chasm. His world, once ruled by the known and the rational, was now a chaotic world of the unknown and the inexplicable. Bentonville was no longer just a quaint little town in Arkansas. It was a battleground where humanity clashed with alien horror. The quiet rhythm of Bentonville was gradually replaced by an uncanny silence as the days dwindled. This once humble town was now a tableau of haunting suspense, with Edwin standing at its epicenter. The tangible tension was no longer a hushed whisper, but a deafening chorus of the impending unknown. In the confines of Doris's office, his interactions took on a sense of finality. The terror that they were facing was no longer an invisible force, but an unavoidable eventuality. We've done what we can, Doris, he admitted, a bitter taste of defeat touching his words. This, this is bigger than us. Doris nodded, her eyes showing an understanding of the extraordinary reality they were confronting. What do we do now, Ed? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. 
He took a deep breath, the weight of his decision heavy on his shoulders. We embrace it, he said, his voice steady despite the tremor in his heart. The shelter, once a refuge for the forgotten souls, had become the stage for the final act of this cosmic play. The air was thick with a heavy anticipation, a silence before the storm. He met with Joe, their conversation now a goodbye hidden under layers of bravado and shared memories. You've been a good friend, Ed, Joe confessed, his gruff exterior wavering for a moment. Edwin, a testament to the unwavering spirit of humanity, managed a genuine smile. Likewise, Joe, he found himself standing at the threshold of the shelter, his heart pounding a fierce rhythm against the otherworldly silence. He took one last look at Bentonville, the quaint little town now a chilling canvas of cosmic horror. And then he stepped inside. There was an eerie elegance to the final moments, a dance between man and alien, reality and the unimaginable. He found himself face to face with the entities. His every instinct screamed at the grotesque sight, the terror threatening to shatter his sanity. But he was not just a journalist. He was a man who had battled poverty, survived hardships, and carried the weight of his town's hopes. He felt the alien parasite slither into his mind, an intrusive force seeking control. He resisted, his spirit battling against the incomprehensible terror. But as the struggle raged on, a terrifying realization began to dawn upon him. The parasite was not just a conqueror. It was an invite to join the cosmic dance of existence, a key to the understanding of the universe's hidden truths. And so in the face of overwhelming terror, he made his choice. His journey from being a tenacious journalist to the last line of defense against a cosmic invasion culminated in his decision to join the dark power. It was not an act of surrender, but a realization of his insignificance and the unfathomable vastness of the cosmos. As the dawn painted the sky with a deceptive tranquility, Bentonville stirred to a new day, unaware of the cosmic transformation that had transpired. And in the heart of it all, a man once dedicated to unearthing stories became a part of the most extraordinary tale ever told, a tale woven in the endless tapestry of cosmic horror. In his embrace of the abyss, Edwin had become an integral part of the cosmic dance, forever entwined in the chilling beauty of the alien invasion. An irregular staccato patter of rain echoed through the worn-out chambers of Peter's small private office. The dimly lit room, filled with the musky scent of old books and a hint of stale coffee, was nestled on the top floor of a waning apartment building in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. A feeble table lamp cast trembling shadows on stacks of yellowing papers that sprawled out like a modest cityscape over his cluttered desk. Peter, a man worn down by years and burdened with the solemn quietude of his own thoughts, sat hunched over a photograph. It was faded by time, dog-eared, bearing the faces of the missing, the lost souls of Pine Bluff. There was a solemn humanness about him as he studied the photo. His kind eyes, despite the unsettling subject, harbored a sense of profound sincerity. On his desk, raindrops danced on the window as they raced down the glass, reflecting a thousand sorrowful goodbyes. He reached out to touch them, fingers tracing the droplets' paths. The faces in the photograph seemed to blur under the weight of his gaze, a haunting mirror to his past. Anxiety, he whispered to himself, his voice barely audible over the monotonous drone of the rain, is a bit like a sewer. His words hung in the air, straddling the boundary between a joke and a revelation. In the years since his diagnosis, he had grown fond of such dark humor. Yet as he turned his gaze from the window to the map of the town sewers sprawled on his desk, his smile faded. The comparison felt too real, too close. A knock echoed through the room, a brief but sharp rap of knuckles against old wood. A moment later, the door creaked open, revealing Sheriff Dunn's tall silhouette framed in the doorway. The sheriff, a portly man with a thick mustache and eyes that told tales of a thousand sleepless nights, held in his hands a brown envelope. Peter, he started, his gruff voice coated with a layer of unease. Got something you might want to look at. Peter took the envelope, noting the creased worry lines etching a deeper story on the sheriff's weathered face. Inside, he found more photographs, pictures of graffiti scrawled on the sewer walls. 
strange symbols and cryptic inscriptions. His heart clenched as he drew a shuddering breath, something eerie and familiar lurking in the edges of those scribbled shapes. You reckon there's a connection? The sheriff asked, breaking the silence that had fallen between them. He found himself drawn back to the images, the symbols whispering tales of a mystery buried beneath the town. He felt the edges of his old trauma stir within him, and he squashed it down, asserting control. I don't know yet, Dunn, he replied, voice steady but eyes never leaving the photos, but I aim to find out. It was at this moment that the rain seemed to pause, holding its breath in anticipation. Beneath the rhythmic drumming of water against glass, he heard a faint whisper, a specter of fear that seemed to resonate with the wind. It was an echo from the depths, a call from the belly of the beast. As the dawn stretched its golden fingers over Pine Bluff, Peter stood at the mouth of the sewer, staring down into the dark abyss. The smell of decay clung to the damp air, a sharp contrast to the wholesome scent of morning dew that blanketed the town above. His heart pounded in his chest, each thump a drum echoing the call of his looming descent. The rusty iron bars bore silent witness to his trepidation. Down there in the depths, he knew he would encounter more than just the physical detritus of Pine Bluff. The sewers, much like his anxiety, were a symbol of the hidden, the unacknowledged, the forgotten. Shaking off the tight knot of unease, he stepped forward, armed with nothing more than his worn-out map and a reliable lantern. As he ventured deeper, he became a mere shadow dancing on the graffiti-streaked walls. The echoes of water dripping into dark pools played a symphony of the macabre, drowning out the comforting songs of morning birds. The air was thick and heavy, pressing against his senses and making his torchlight seem feeble against the overwhelming darkness. He found himself enveloped by solitude, punctuated only by the occasional murmur of rats scurrying unseen in the darkness. Despite the oppressive solitude, there was a sort of kinship here. His anxiety, ever his faithful companion, was with him in these moments, whispering old fears into his ear. Yet he pressed on, his footsteps slow but resolute. In the cold, hushed silence of the sewers, he came across a wall bearing the same cryptic symbols he'd seen in the photographs. His fingers traced the chilled stone, the rough texture of the painted symbols echoing a haunting melody of past and present merging. Secrets, he muttered to himself, the word hanging in the dank air. He felt a strange resonance with the wall, the painted symbols, the chilling echoes of the sewer. It was like reading a language he had forgotten, he knew. Suddenly, a soft, pulsating force pulled him deeper into the labyrinth, an invisible undercurrent drawing him towards a particular tunnel. The sensation was inexplicable and instinctive. Despite his racing heart, he found himself drawn to this force, a moth lured by the flame of curiosity. As he walked through the tunnel, he found the remnants of what appeared to be arcane rituals. An ancient-looking stone altar sat in the center of a cavernous chamber, surrounded by a perfect circle of burnt-out candles. The sight sent a shiver running down his spine. His anxiety responded in kind, a cacophony of warning bells ringing in his head. Dread had painted an elaborate mural in the chamber, a symphony of fear orchestrated in silence. Yet his gaze was drawn towards a single phrase etched on the wall behind the altar that stirred a haunting familiarity within him. It was like a whisper from the past, an echo that bounced through the chambers of his heart. From the depths, we ascend. As the whispers grew louder, he realized he was no longer alone in the depths of the sewers. Something lurked in the shadows, unseen but omnipresent, watching him. He felt it in the echoes bouncing off the grimy walls, in the shadows that danced in his torchlight. Something ancient, something hungry. His breath hitched in his chest, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against his ribs. He stood there at the precipice of the unknown, staring into the face of his past traumas and the lurking terror of Pine Bluff. In the days following his descent, Peter began to weave together the threads of a dark tapestry hidden beneath Pine Bluff. The town's usual tranquil facade seemed tainted to him now, stained by the invisible ink of sinister undercurrents. 
His investigation pulled him into the heart of the town's historical archives, a labyrinth of knowledge almost as intimidating as the sewers themselves. Poring over aging books and dusty manuscripts, he began to unearth secrets that time had eagerly buried. Tales of a mysterious cult wound themselves around the town's history, coiled around the roots of its founding families. A blackened veil, it seemed, had been draped over Pine Bluff for generations, a shroud that concealed the whispered packs and forgotten rites. Meanwhile, he found himself drawn towards the peculiar behavior of the townsfolk. Their eyes held an odd, glassy sheen, their smiles too uniform, their laughter devoid of genuine warmth. Conversations seemed rehearsed, each word a note in a tune that held no melody. It was as if an unseen puppeteer pulled at their strings, a force he had come to recognize all too well. One afternoon, he crossed paths with Clara, the town librarian. Clara was a spinster, her aging grace adorned with a veneer of wisdom that commanded respect. As he shared his observations with her, he noticed a shiver pass through Clara, a ripple disturbing the placid surface of her well-composed demeanor. You tread on sacred ground, Peter, she warned, her voice barely a whisper. The veiled threat hung in the air, an echo of the unseen dangers lurking beneath the town. He was unfazed. His traumatic past had forged him into a vessel of resilience. He gazed at Clara, his silence a fortress against her words. You may be right, Clara, he replied evenly but I intend to uncover the truth. In the solitude of his office later that night, he felt a chilling sense of familiarity. He saw the hypnotic influence of the cult reflecting his own struggles with anxiety, a warped mirror image of his mind's control. Fear, he realized, was a universal puppeteer, the threads it pulled capable of ensnaring not just a solitary man, but an entire town. As the days bled into nights, he found himself caught in a relentless dance. Between his investigations and the ever-watchful eyes of the townsfolk, he was spinning, spiraling towards the epicenter of an unfathomable mystery. The whispers grew louder, the echoes of the sewers ringing in his ears, an ominous drumbeat to the rhythm of his investigation. In the quiet stillness of his office, he sat back, the gravity of his findings weighing heavy on his mind. The eerie symbols, the cult, the brainwashed townsfolk, they were all pieces of an intricate puzzle, a cosmic design far more terrifying than he had initially perceived. He knew then that his journey was far from over. He had only lifted a corner of the blackened veil. The real horror, the true face of the abyss, still awaited him in the depths. And in that realization, he felt the stirrings of an old, familiar fear. Yet alongside it, a new resolve was kindled, burning brighter with every passing second. The return to the sewers felt like a descent into an age-old nightmare, each echoing drip a haunting reminder of Peter's first venture into the depths. He felt the familiar curl of apprehension unfurl within him, his anxiety singing a chilling lullaby in the shadows of his mind. Yet he pressed on, drawn by an unyielding resolve a need to unveil the shrouded truth that lurked beneath Pine Bluff. Navigating the labyrinthine tunnels, he was drawn towards a previously unexplored path. The air here held an ancient chill, a cold that seemed to seep from the very stone itself. The torchlight barely penetrated the gloom, and the graffiti symbols seemed to twist and morph in the flickering light, alive with an eldritch energy. The path led him to a cavern larger and more menacing than the one he'd found before. The air was dense, a palpable murkiness that cloaked the room in a shroud of dread. At the center, an obelisk stood tall, etched with the same symbols that had started to haunt his dreams. Suddenly, a bone-chilling chorus filled the chamber, a symphony of whispers rising from the darkness, carrying tales of eons past. He could feel unseen eyes upon him, observing him from the blackened corners of the cavern. The abyss was watching. Sweat beaded on his forehead, his heart pounding desperately against his ribs. Yet he found himself drawn towards the obelisk, its presence pulling at something primal within him. His fingers brushed against the stone surface, and a rush of images flooded his mind, a tidal wave of alien visions and forgotten horrors. 
He saw the townsfolk gathered in shadowy rituals beneath the cloak of night, their faces blank and eyes gleaming with an unnatural light. He saw the faces of the missing, their expressions twisted in a horrifying rapture as they embraced the dark. He saw himself standing at the precipice of the abyss, its formless horror reaching out towards him. He recoiled, gasping for breath as the echoes of the vision continued to resonate within him. His mind was a whirlpool of terror, his anxiety screaming for him to flee. Yet he forced himself to calm, drawing on the same inner strength that had seen him through years of living with his disorder. Summoning every shred of his resolve, he turned his gaze back to the obelisk. The whispers had quietened. The unseen audience seemed to hold its breath. In that silence, he reached out once more, pressing his palm flat against the stone. The obelisk pulsed beneath his touch, a heartbeat that echoed the rhythm of his own. His mind teetered on the precipice of understanding, of recognizing the formless horror that loomed in the dark. Yet he knew he had to return to the surface, to the facade of normalcy that Pine Bluff had crafted so skillfully. There were more secrets to uncover, more threads to unravel. With a lingering look at the obelisk, he retraced his steps back to the entrance of the sewer. As he emerged into the twilight of the coming dawn, he knew that the abyss had changed him. Its eyes had seen into his soul, its whispers had filled his mind, and he was no longer just an observer. He became a part of the mystery, an actor on the cosmic stage of Pine Bluff's Dark Symphony. Days faded into a timeless blur as Peter plunged further into the enigma that was Pine Bluff. A ceaseless tangle of leads, hushed conversations, and chilling discoveries occupied his time above ground. Yet it was the beckoning pull of the abyss below that gnawed at the corners of his mind, a constant hum that was growing increasingly difficult to ignore. In the sleepless nights, he found himself confronted with memories of the obelisk. He saw the glyphs etched into its surface dance in the darkness behind his closed eyelids, their silent song winding its way into his dreams. He felt an uncanny connection to the ancient stone, a bond that transcended time and reality. With each passing day, the townsfolk grew more distant, their eyes clouding over with a veil of suspicion. He felt their gazes on him, cold as the stone obelisk, their whispers trailing him like spectral chains. He was an outsider now, a threat to the veiled order that had held Pine Bluff captive for generations. Yet he pressed on, fueled by a growing sense of dread and a resilient will to expose the town's ancient curse. He felt the pull of the abyss grow stronger, its whispers growing louder in his ears, its echoes resonating within his heart. And then the night arrived when he could no longer resist the call. Under the blanket of darkness, he once again descended into the sewers. This time, his steps were not hesitant. They held a determined rhythm, echoing off the grimy walls and leading him deeper into the labyrinth. The cavern loomed in front of him, its obelisk pulsating with an eerie luminescence, a beacon guiding him through the suffocating darkness. The air buzzed with an alien energy, the stone humming a hymn that only he could hear. He moved closer, the familiar dread dancing on the fringes of his consciousness. His hand reached out, pressing against the cold surface of the obelisk. This time, he was prepared for the onslaught of visions, the torrent of whispers that surged towards him. A sense of profound understanding washed over him. He was not merely up against a town's dark history, he was confronting an ancient force that thrived on fear, a cosmic horror that fed on the minds of Pine Bluff's residents. He was in its lair, its eyes watching him from the abyss. In that moment, a surge of adrenaline coursed through his veins. This was his fight, his chance to break free from the clutches of fear. His past trauma, his struggle with anxiety had all led him to this pivotal moment. With renewed resolve, Peter tore his hand from the obelisk. The cavern around him seemed to shudder, the whispers growing into a frenzied cacophony. He turned his back on the obelisk, on the abyss in its haunting gaze, and ran. As he sprinted through the labyrinth, he felt a seismic shift within him. He was no longer the hunted, but the hunter. No longer a mere spectator, but a player in this cosmic game. 
The echoes of the abyss chased him, their cries a fading symphony in the recesses of the tunnels. He emerged from the sewer just as dawn began to break, its golden rays cutting through the gloom of Pine Bluff. He felt a sense of release, of breaking free from a confining cocoon, even as the undercurrent of his terrifying experience hummed beneath the surface. He had faced the eyes of the abyss and lived to tell the tale. He was changed, marked by his encounter with the cosmic horror beneath the town. In the embrace of the early morning light, Peter understood. His past trauma, his struggles had shaped him, tempered him into a man capable of facing the unseen horrors. He was a beacon in the dark, a sentinel against the abyss. And though the echoes of Pine Bluff would forever haunt him, he would stand resolute and undaunted, ready to face whatever cosmic horrors the future might hold. The office was a time capsule, a derelict vessel marooned in the great sea of the present. Its ancient wooden panels were filled with indents, each a scar from battles long forgotten. Dusty papers were strewn about in a seeming state of disarray, the old ceiling fan above threatening to scatter them further with every lethargic turn. Daylight angled through the window, casting long and short shadows on the discolored wallpaper, every stain a relic of a coffee-spilled afternoon. At the epicenter of this orchestrated chaos sat Detective Arthur Morgan, as much a fixture of the room as the antiquated rotary phone that clung stubbornly to the edge of his cluttered desk. His granite eyes, aged prematurely by years of treading where angels feared, stared out the window at the fleeting dusk, lost in a sea of thought. The shrill ring of the phone cut through the silence like a knife, shattering the tranquil illusion. He pulled the receiver to his ear with a wary hand, his brow furrowing at the terse information trickling from the other end. Hot Springs, Arkansas, he echoed, the name of the town seeping into his consciousness like a drop of ink in clear water. He could almost see it, an innocuous little town nestled in verdant valleys, oblivious to the storm about to make landfall. A town holding its breath, ensnared by the charisma of a religious leader in a mothballed warehouse. And above all secrets, a thousand invisible threads weaving a tapestry too intricate to decipher at a glance. The promise of the case glimmered before him like a distant beacon. It was a chance, a stepping stone to the advancement he'd been longing for, but the undertow of uncertainty pulled at him. He looked at the worn photograph on his desk, the image of a younger, less hardened man staring back at him, taken atop a cliff. The same man who'd since developed a debilitating fear of heights. That photo, a monument to a past he couldn't erase, to a trauma that still clung like a shadow. With a determined sigh, he tucked the photograph into a drawer and made his decision. The fear was there, but so was the unquenchable fire to face it. He rose from his chair, the old leather groaning in protest, and started to gather his things. Hot Springs was calling. As the last vestiges of sunlight were swallowed by the impending night, his office faded into a semi-darkness, a fitting reflection of the ambiguously shadowed path he was about to tread. Hot springs, an epitome of tranquility wrapped in verdant folds of the land, lay beneath the ever-watchful gaze of the mottled Arkansas sky. From afar, it was a symphony of life, the houses dotted like notes on an orchestra's sheet music. But up close, a harmony of whispers reverberated through its quiet streets, narratives woven through the texture of everyday life. Morgan found himself in the heart of it all, a stranger treading on unfamiliar terrain. The town was unassuming, its veneer of normalcy a paradox to the unfolding mystery. He felt the essence of hot springs, like a heartbeat beneath the surface, simultaneously comforting and unsettling. He stood at the threshold of the local church, an architectural relic echoing the town's storied past. The sermon was in progress, the religious leader's words imbued with the mystique of a born charmer. His voice was soft yet resonant, and it filled the church with a spectral enchantment, drawing in the faithful like a beacon. There was something there behind those captivating eyes, an echo of something profound, something hidden. Post-sermon, he decided to blend into the fabric of the crowd, his detective's instinct surfacing, 
He introduced himself to the locals. His inquiries masked as amiable chatter. Each conversation was a window into their lives, a mosaic of fear and devotion interlaced. Underneath the reverence, Morgan felt the underlying tremor of unease. As the day folded into a cloak of star-studded twilight, he found himself observing the infamous warehouse from a safe distance. The old structure stood like a derelict phantom, the faintest hint of strange shadows disappearing into its gaping maw. He could see the water tower nearby, a prime vantage point, yet a chilling reminder of his acrophobia. His heart pounded in his chest, a deafening drum against the quiet of the night. Choosing prudence over audacity, he retreated to his temporary lodgings. His mind was a whirlwind of thoughts, of theories that tugged at the fringes of his understanding. He knew the depths of this case held something far more complex than a detective's standard fare. His dreams were haunted by the religious leader's captivating gaze, the eerie warehouse, and a dizzying fall from the water tower that seemed to echo his past trauma. The sun stood aloof in the azure expanse of the sky, its fierce glare mellowing into a delicate warmth. Amid the sounds of the town coming to life, the deserted warehouse lurked in eerie silence. A relic of forgotten times, it brooded under the weight of a hundred secrets, its enigmatic aura swallowing the sunlight like a parched beast. Morgan stood at its threshold, a solitary figure dwarfed by the monstrous edifice. He took a moment to steal himself, breathing in the stark emptiness. The wind whispered strange melodies as it whistled through the cracked walls, a spectral orchestra playing a symphony only he could hear. Pushing open the heavy door, the detective stepped into the musty darkness, his eyes tracing the faint outlines of dusty crates and broken machinery. He flicked on his flashlight, its beam slicing through the gloom, revealing strange symbols etched onto the walls, cryptic and ancient. Each symbol seemed to pulse with an unspoken energy, a language only the initiated could decipher. His heart echoed with a distant drumbeat of cosmic dread. A particular symbol caught his attention, an inky spiral radiating outwards, a haunting mimicry of a galaxy. He took out his notepad, sketching the symbol, his mind processing its possible implications. A rusted incense burner lay overturned nearby, the residue of an alien aroma lingering. He found a robe too, crimson as the eye of a setting sun, adorned with more of the symbols. The atmosphere of the warehouse was an entity in itself, its unseen tendrils curling around his being. The persistent chill teased his senses, and the whisper of the wind felt like a secret conversation he wasn't privy to. An uncanny sensation of being watched lingered, like invisible eyes scrutinizing his every move. He found himself shivering, not from the cold, but from an alien dread seeping into his marrow. That night, Morgan's dreams were infested by the warehouse. The symbols danced in front of his eyes, warping and twisting, their meaning just beyond his grasp. He fell endlessly into the inky spiral, an echo of his acrophobia transforming into a fear of something far larger and more dreadful. The robe draped over him like a crimson death shroud, suffocating his senses, drowning him in its foreign scent. He woke up with a start, his scream a mere gasp, a prisoner trapped within his throat. Moonlight peeked through the curtain window, casting a ghastly pallor over his sweat-soaked form. He sat up, gasping for air, his heart thudding wildly against his ribcage. The symbols from the warehouse pulsated in his mind, a twisted song echoing through the hollow chambers of his psyche. Morgan, sitting in the dimly lit confines of his temporary lodgings, felt the tendrils of reality and the unthinkable merging into a maddening kaleidoscope. His mind was a spinning dervish, dancing on the edge of comprehension as he meticulously pieced together the elaborate puzzle. The enigmatic symbols, the crimson robe, and the disquieting atmosphere of the warehouse were elements of a broader tableau that unveiled itself like a cosmic ballet. His investigation led him down obscure paths, unearthing forbidden texts and clandestine practices. He came to understand that the charismatic religious leader was not merely a shepherd to his congregation, but a high priest of a secret cult. A cult that revered an entity not from ancient tomes, but from the void of cosmic infinity. The revelation was a thunderclap in his world, 
resonating with an unbearable dread. The man he'd heard preaching compassion was a puppet master, pulling the strings that made them dance to the tunes of an otherworldly horror. He confronted the religious leader, his detective's mask replaced with an accuser's resolve. The leader only smiled, his eyes gleaming with an unsettling calm. He extended an offer of enlightenment, a promise of revelation that Morgan had no intention of accepting. As the detective delved deeper, he became the eye of a storm he wished he'd never stirred. The cult, becoming aware of his intrusion, decided to intervene. Late one evening, as twilight whispered tales of approaching darkness, they ambushed him. The chase was a chaotic dance, twisting through the labyrinthine streets of Hot Springs. It led him up a winding hill, his acrophobia whispering silent threats, a cruel echo of the heights he feared. His heart pounded against his ribs like a frantic bird against a living cage, but he kept on, propelled by adrenaline and a desperate need to survive. His escape was a narrow shave, the teeth of the beast grazing his coattails as he burst out onto the overlooking cliff. He doubled over, panting, his fear of heights momentarily dwarfed by the reality of his situation. As he glanced back at the town, its innocent facade marred by the shadow of the cult, he felt a sense of foreboding. He was not just against the cult, but against an entity that transcended his understanding. A heavy pall of despair hung over Hot Springs. Even the usually ebullient bird song sounded like a mournful dirge, and the wind whispered a melancholic lament. Morgan stood in the throes of a terrible dawn, the comforting blanket of his worldview torn asunder, leaving him in the chilling grip of a horrifying reality. Each passing moment was a crucible, tempering his spirit, fueling a defiant resilience. The town was in the grip of an entity whose power rippled from an abyss beyond the veil of known cosmos. He realized he was but a moat in the vast machinery of existence, his investigation merely scratching the surface of a grand cosmic horror. His confrontation with the cult was an ominous dance. He was surrounded, the charismatic leader at the forefront, his gaze a terrible promise of impending doom. Morgan could see the fervor in their eyes, a burning testament to their devotion. The leader's words echoed in the eerie silence, a dark prayer inviting the cosmic entity into their realm. As the group began their ritualistic chant, the air around them hummed with unseen energy. Reality quivered, and a nebulous void gaped in the air above them, a door to the cosmic abyss. He felt an oppressive wave of terror washing over him, a visceral confirmation of his worst fears. The entity was no mere belief. It was a pulsating reality, its essence seeping into his world. Just as he thought he was at the end, he found himself seized by a rush of adrenaline. His instincts screamed at him, a primal urge to survive. With a burst of unexpected energy, he threw himself into a breakneck sprint, darting away from the gathering. The chase was a surreal blur, his fear of heights forgotten in the face of a greater horror. He could hear the cultists behind him, their chance a thunderous tide riding on the currents of the wind. The sprint ended as abruptly as it started, with Morgan tumbling down a concealed slope, landing onto the banks of a secluded creek. The cultists lost his trail, their distant chance swallowed by the whispering winds. Panting heavily, Morgan took refuge in the creeping shadows of the dense woods, his heart pounding a desperate rhythm of escape. He made his way back to his office under the shroud of darkness. His body was unscathed, but his mind was marred by the scars of cosmic horror. His career advancement seemed a trivial pursuit now, an empty goal in the face of an unthinkable reality. As he sat alone in the dim light, a shell-shocked survivor in the aftermath of a cosmic catastrophe. The magnitude of his escape hit him. He had fled, but the entity remained, a lurking nightmare in the heart of Hot Springs. He had been a pawn in a game too vast to comprehend, a witness to a reality he wished was mere fantasy. His escape had not been from the cult alone, but from the embrace of a horror that spanned across the unfathomable cosmos. We appreciate you tuning in. If you fancied the content, show your support with a like and subscribe. Hit the bell to keep up with our eerie adventures. Eldritch Tales Factory has plenty more to offer. Until next time.